Hi, I'm Lauren Blackett of Soltar Solutions, and I am really excited to be here today on Focus Forward. We have an awesome guest that's going to give lots of information to business owners, homeowners, everyone out there, and how they can help to um, conserve energy. So, I hope you will help me welcome Joe Bowman here with us today. Joe. Tell Hi, us about what you do. It's, it's awesome to be on your show again. I think you have some amazing guests that show up here, so Thank I you. always enjoy watching this program. So, um, I want to just share a little bit about our company, Residential Living Systems. We're a design-build company. We do a lot of high-energy performance kind of work. So, um, people that come to us really are either doing a renovation project or new construction and looking for a house that's a little bit more in the uh, energy performance category than a standard construction house. So, tell us, what does that mean? Um, typically a house will have uh, problems where it's either leaky at the windows or the doors and a lot of people can really do some basic upgrades on their house if they would just start with looking um, probably with an energy audit would be a starting place for a lot of people uh, understanding what the house is actually doing um, from a more diagnostic kind of approach so they come in with this thing called a blower door they insert it into the frame of the house at the front door and it's a big canvas uh, frame and it's got this massive fan that turns the house into kind of like a hurricane stage so it's either filling the house up like a balloon or it's deflating the house so you kind of think of your house getting in pressurized in that process and then when you do that you can start to identify where leaks are sneaking in the building uh, where airflow is moving around doors and windows, outlets, you can put your hand in front of an outlet and you can actually feel the air blowing across your hand. So a, a energy audit is a fantastic way and when you do it at the, the winter time or when it's a little bit colder out you can also bring in an, a piece of equipment called an infrared camera and that's kind of like that sort of, you see it on like a lot of the uh, forensic spook shows where they have the ghost and they go around looking for the ghost. The infrared camera actually identifies heat movement in the walls. Um, so then when you combine that with the blower door, you actually see where airflow is moving in through the house and migrating out and around window frames, door frames, weird places and wall systems. So there's a lot of stuff that you can't normally see with the, the naked eye that the infrared camera will pick up. So it, it picks up a heat signature in the, in, inside that structure of the house. So it's a great combination of two tools. And then when they do that, then you can get a report back from the energy auditor. They'll tell you where to uh, add insulation. You might need to do some improvements around window tightening with caulk or uh, ceiling or depending on how bad the house is you may need to replace some stuff so it's a it's a great way for people to get a, a quick snapshot in a couple of hours of how their building is performing so what what would be the the cost of something like that you know an approximate cost on it well depending on the utility company that people are, are working with there's the opportunity that they have subsidized energy audits so uh, Excel and Minnesota Power and Great River Energy all these groups have um, what, what they have is a, an energy audit program and they will basically subcontract with uh, a company that will come in provide the energy audit in about two or three hours and typically that cost can be anywhere from 75 to 100 125 dollars so with the infrared camera um, they bring in a, a, a set of tools that they can then do this quick diagnostic they'll also look at uh, heating and cooling equipment and get an idea if there's any kind of issues there so they give a pretty good snapshot of the building in a couple of hours so it's a really great way for people to understand what kind of improvements are possible in their house. So it's, it's starting at the low level kind of things where they could look at changing out light bulbs or improving um, the performance of their water heater by putting a blanket on. Mm -hmm. There's things like that that people can do, but there's also bigger things where they could start to actually invest in um, having their ceiling um, of the, uh, the, the attic deck inside the, um, the, the attic where they would come in and spray foam around holes that are coming up. So anywhere where you have an electric wire coming up into the attic space or a plumbing fixture that has a pipe coming up through the attic space, those holes leak air all the way out and through the building. And so they would come through with a foam crew, they would foam those cavities and then put insulation over the top of that. So in, at the end of that, you've, you've got an opportunity to capture a lot of the heat loss in the building and stop the air leakage at the same time. So that air sealing process is really key before adding insulation. So when we're looking at it, between $75 and $150, $120, whatever, you could recoup that um, investment quite quickly here in Minnesota. Def definitely. And, and the cost of a typical insulation fix can be around $1,300 to $1,500. Depending on the size of the house, it might get up into three or five thousand dollars, and that energy savings then comes back pretty quickly from that process. And then also looking at 
uh, the potential that if you don't have insulation in your walls or it's a very minimal amount, you may also have to do uh, uh, putting insulation in those walls and then looking at sealing up some of those holes around windows and, and leaky spots in the house. So it might require uh, better weather stripping around the door frames. So there's a lot of small strategies that if you combine them actually add up. But if you do them individually and don't do them comprehensively, um, you're just you're, you're patching one small spot and then air is going to move somewhere else in the building. So when you're doing it, try to do more of it. For instance, don't just you know put the you know foam around the the switch plates and expect that that's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you think of the house kind of as more of a system, it's easier to look at the fact that air is going to come in from wherever it can get access to a hole. So if you have heat that wants to rise and go out of the building going up, that air has got to be replaced somewhere. So it's going to pull in cold air. As that hot air goes up, mm -hmm. the cold air is being pulled in. And so stopping those places. Another big loss place is around in basements where they have uh, the top of the, the block wall. There's a board called the rim joist, and there's, there's usually no insulation in that cavity. Or people will try to wedge fiberglass in there, and, and then when you compress fiberglass, it's, it's basically like stuffing a towel in there, and it's really not stopping airflow or insulating. And so that cold air comes in through that place. So spray foaming that cavity and then uh, taking care of the attic deck, those two com combined efforts really make a big difference in a house. Excellent. So what is it you actually, do, do you provide the energy audit or what is it you actually do to um, help people to have their offices and homes more energy efficient? Our team actually comes in with a more integrated approach. So we will identify kind of what the client's needs are. So if there's issues in terms of an existing building of space or comfort, we identify what the, the client's goals are first and then we'll go through and do kind of that forensics process. We'll do um, a little bit larger of an energy audit. We'll also look at the potential for renewable energy opportunities. And then we'll give more of a comprehensive set of uh, diagnostics of what's going on in the building and then give recommendations of how to improve that process in addition to if there are space needs. So if they want to do remodeling or add on uh, more square footage to the house, we integrate that into a set of plans and create um, a report that identifies what could be done in either a whole step or over a period of time in phases. So if somebody wanted to do phase one and, and invest you know, fifty to $75,000 for the renovation project and then you know, phase two a period of time later when they've paid that off. So we give those opportunities to the client and then we come through and then coordinate that uh, process. And what we want to do is really get that building to um, a specific stage of where it's, it's closer to being able to use 70% less energy for a renovation project. So we're really looking at uh, turning the building completely around and changing the way it performs. And then if we can, if the client wants to go even further, then we match up a renewable energy system with that and we'll either take out um, the domestic hot water and, and connect that with uh, a solar thermal system or we'll look at producing uh, electricity through solar collectors on, on the photovoltaic end. So there's two different routes there that either they want to just save energy or they want to produce energy. And when they go far enough, then they could actually produce as much energy as the building uses and, and create what they call a net zero building. Or they can go further beyond that and, and create a surplus of energy that then they're sending electricity back to the utility company. At that stage, they become a power producer, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's the forefront thinking of how we can do buildings in, in the 21st century. Okay, so let's roll back for a second. So when you're talking about the investment of seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars, you're not just talking about the adjusting the energy. You're actually talking about adjusting the space. Am I right? Right. We want to we want to first meet the, the client needs and goals. So if they are needing more space, we want to make sure that, that we're doing that. But in that process, we we try to capture the opportunity. If we're if we're cutting holes in the walls, that's a great time to re insulate and, and look at how the envelope of the building is performing all the way around the structure. And rather than just fix one area, we go comprehensive and try to get as much of, of the capture of, we, of the building as we can. So. so one of the questions I have about space is, you know, from what I read and I know myself, I have a lot of space in my house, but that space is not usable in the wintertime. So, so my house in the wintertime becomes a lot smaller than the rest of the year because of the of the cold. So in looking at it, for some people, I don't think it's additional space. I just think it's usability of the space that they have. 
Yeah, we want we want to make sure that the uh, the livable space is actually being accessible, and part of that really is identifying through that energy audit process where are the big leaks going to be, and if there's a comfort issue, we're going to find that out from the client because they're going to say, "I can't sit in this part of the house; mm -hmm. it's it's frigid," mm -hmm. and so we're going to look at what's going on in that wall, and we may have to draw some uh, more information by drilling holes in the walls or. Uh, other ways of, of finding out, is there any insulation in that wall at all? And if not, then we can pop off the siding and then add insulation to those cavities in the wall system as well. But in, in the end, if the house isn't functioning in a usable stage, then we really want to find that out in the beginning so that we can start to say, there are uh, X number of issues in the house, which ones do you want to tackle first? Mm -hmm. And if it's going to be um, big expenses, we want to make sure we get the, the building envelope doing its job first and then make sure we're controlling any other uh, potential moisture issues because the tighter you make the building, the more likelihood of, of if you have showers or cooking with lots of water, boiling water, you get more steam and, and moisture buildup in that house. It doesn't have any place to go once you tighten it up. When it's leaky and, and if air is flowing mm -hmm. through, you know, it's great, you'd have natural ventilation. But once you start to tighten that box up, then you can almost create a Petri dish out of the house and turn it into a biological <laughs> experiment. And that happened a lot in the 1990s. Uh, our building materials and, and systems were getting better at tightening buildings and they weren't controlling ventilation inside the houses and so where moisture was building up they were getting a lot of mold problems in wall cavities and people were getting what they called sick building syndrome and it was a pretty big issue for a while. So we want to make sure we control ventilation and uh, the heat loss. Component. And how do you do that? How do you control the ventilation and the heat loss? How do you, how do you go about, and things like radon, I mean how do you go about do, dealing with that? Well, again, we go back to more of a systems approach. So we try to integrate multiple pieces into the strategy. So if we're tightening up the building to a certain point where it's really, really tight, we want to make sure that we're providing fresh ventilation. And our strategy really is 100% fresh ventilation. And so once we get to a, a you know, it's, if it's kind of like living in a plastic bag, if you think of how tight the building is, and then we bring in fresh air. And you can always still open windows, so there's no, no reason why you can't open a window. But during that heating season, we'd want to keep that heat energy in the box, and we transfer that with a, what they call a heat recovery unit, and that thing is connected with our ventilation system. So it's providing fresh air that's 100% fresh ventilation, but it's also capturing that heat energy as the exhaust air is going out, we're capturing that heat before it, it goes out of the building as the air is coming in. So the heat exchanger basically transfers that heat energy to stay in the building with the air that's coming in. Um, the other route would be uh, the bath fan is an easy one, or a kitchen fan. Just making sure that if you have a, like a gas appliance, that you're ventilating that piece of equipment so that there's not a buildup of gas in the house, because that's another big issue is um, a lot of people have carbon monoxide poisoning in houses. So a, a safety fix that we always make sure that's there and it's required by state code is that you have carbon monoxide detectors that are functioning and not just sitting there because a lot of people put them in five years later, forget they're even existing, and the battery's dead and they're hanging out on the wall plugged in and they don't want work anymore. So they do need to be replaced on a regular basis too. Wow. So how did you get so interested in this? Tell me a little bit about your background. Um, I actually went to Indiana University, uh, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, and there was a program instructor that was from Germany and she brought over a lot of ideas from Europe and this was back in the 1990s where um, I think the the process of looking at urban development and economic systems and green building and renewable energy, all these th and, and localized food systems were a lot more progressed in Europe than they were in the United States. And I think those things were catching on and, and kind of started in places in the United States, but there were pockets. And so this instructor brought in this class called Ecological Designs. And the way she taught the class was really thinking about it in terms of system perspectives. How does the entire system function instead of just, you know, how do you change one little thing? It's how do you look at the whole uh, set of pieces and how they interact. So that class really shifted my thinking. And then I went on to um, stay out in Portland, Oregon, where I was involved with a company called Environmental Building Supplies. And that was kind of a hub of activity where you had all kinds of contractors, designers, clients, and people that wanted to know about green building kind of stuff, and so there was a lot of access to a lot of knowledge, and then I came back to uh, University of Minnesota and took their Sustainable Design and Architecture program and got a master's in uh, science in Sustainable Design and Architecture. So that, that stream kind of moved into um, building performance where I could look at design 
and energy performance and kind of take that sort of physics brain and the creative side brain and, and put those two together. And I, I got into a program called uh, Passive House, which comes out of Germany, which essentially they, they do a study on the building. Um, a lot of this energy auditing that I'm talking about, they take it to the next level and they add in a lot of energy modeling with software. So when you integrate all these pieces and you noodle down to the, the very small margins of what can be done in a building, that's where you can actually identify uh, converting the building into saving up to 90% of the heat energy in the box. And when you go to that stage, then you can think of it in terms of um, you could heat a building with the same amount of energy that you could with two hair dryers. The amount of energy there is about 3,000 watts. So it's a very different set of strategies to get there. Well, when you're talking about complete systems, can you break that down a little bit? Because for me, that sounds like we've really moved far away from doing an energy audit or doing, you know, plugging up the little holes and insulation. Uh, when you're talking about this complete system, can you give us a little bit more of a insight into what that system actually is? So the, the, there's a handful of strategies along with the energy modeling, which that will take in information about where the house is located. So it's really important to have the data about the climate and are there shading from trees, you know, what kind of buildings around it. So we, we really want to find out what's going on around the box in terms of where it's sitting. And then from there we can identify wind patterns. I mean, there's a lot of data that, that noodles into this software. And then when you start thinking about where you're going to place the windows, how big is the box, what shape is the box, all those pieces go into the, the, the criteria for entering into the information in this spreadsheet and then the type of windows, the thickness of the insulation. So and in terms of a systems part, the diagnostic tool is huge um, from the, the modeling side. And then when we actually put the box together, uh, key pieces, the, um, the building itself, if you think of creating an air tightness layer that would wrap all the way around the box. So um, insulation would go underneath the, the, either the basement slab or the um, slab on grade and then you would connect that insulation to the wall system. So you're thinking about insulation that could be, in Minnesota, we could be looking at um, anywhere from 10 to, to 16 inches thick of a wall. So it's a lot thicker of a wall system. And we wanna make sure that there's an air tightness layer in that wall system. And then we're looking at windows that are a little bit more robust that might be uh, triple pane windows as opposed to single or double pane windows that we normally have in houses. And then uh, that other piece that I'd mentioned before was the ventilation system and a heat exchanger. So when you start to package insulation, air tightness, uh, better performing windows and doors, and then you orient the house so that it's actually picking up a lot more of the, the sun's warmth in the wintertime, and then making sure you shade the box properly on those windows so that you're not microwaving the people in the, in the summer. Um, when you start putting all those pieces together, and reduce the number of holes that are going out of the box. Uh, you make it a tighter box. And then at that stage, then you can identify um, the performance of the building and get it to a stage where all these systems working together, um, the sum of the parts are, are making the whole at that stage. So it's all these little details, making sure the building is very tight, uh, making sure the connections from the window frame to the box itself and the wall frame, uh, making sure everything is very well detailed in terms of sealing and caulking and taping. All those little pieces, as they add up, you sort of extrapolate the experience to having a really, uh, it, it's kind of like going from the Ford Escort to the, 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 the sports car. You know, this is a high performance box instead mm -hmm. of just, you know, this is, this is the Tesla Roadster versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Mercury Lynx. So it's, it's really a, a house that's zooming along at, at a higher level of, of design thinking. So the end result is you have a smaller heating system, you have a smaller air conditioning system, and more of that in, in terms of investment cost goes into the wall system and the windows and doors. So you still have a very comfortable space and you have a, a very wonderful experience in these houses. Um, it's just uh, the upfront cost is a little bit more. It's about 10 to 15 percent more. Uh, depending on the box it might be 15 to 20 um, overall. So that investment upfront you're paying for performance, and then over the cost of, of a mortgage, you're reducing the energy cost significantly. So that's potentially up to 90% savings on that energy cost over the, over the lifetime of the house. And you're extending the life of that box a lot more. Wow, 90% is huge. Yeah. So as I'm hearing what you're saying, it sounds like it's a design, it's 
like design deficiency, if you will. So you, you know, where the trees are, where the windows are, all this. Is there a bigger picture that we could be going for? Is there, you know, because it seems like that's one thing, that's our own personal consumption. But what about maybe public consumption? Is there a way that we can do things? You know, m one of the things I think about all the time, especially when they're building more roads, is why aren't we people working from home? You know, we have the technology to do that. Is there a bigger, better system that we could be looking at? Well, and that actually brings up a, a really large issue, which is uh, the idea of, uh, of how we roll out housing. And, you know, are we looking at putting housing closer to the, the transit corridor? You know, where, is it closer to transportation opportunities for people to get on buses or trains? Or can they actually change the way their lifestyle is? And so when you start thinking about, you know, your conscious decisions as in terms of your lifestyle, um, can your work be done from home? I think when you're, when you're talking about uh, a lot of people are transitioning their, their work style to being able to do a lot of online work. And that's fantastic because then you're not traveling as much to go on, on significant trips overseas, uh, the transit to work, all those issues. You start to reduce the, the activity of, of transporting your body to someplace and, and use the electrons to do some of that work. And, and so there's a lot less activity in terms of using uh, fossil fuels. The other half then is, is how do we roll out communities and how do we look at uh, production of energy in, in terms of if we're building more boxes and they're going to use more energy, are we rolling out the same number of, of production systems to match that in terms of renewable energy? So could these houses be producing a surplus of energy or uh, office or uh, industrial buildings, could they be producing a surplus of energy in the process of being built? And if we look at them going to the passive house standard, um, they're already halfway, they're, I mean, they're, they're significantly reducing the amount of energy from the start. So every, every um, dollar spent on conservation, you're saving three to five dollars on energy production at, at the other end of it. So when you really think about it, if we look at it on a cultural level, if we're saving energy from the start in the boxes that we're living in and the way we do our transportation, that's that many less power plants we need to, to put out there. And so when people want to transition over to doing renewable energy, part of that battle really is looking at conservation of energy first. And doing it with a smart design is, is huge. And, and comfort is important because we don't want to put people back in caves. We don't want to force them to live in sweaters all their life. You know, I mean, people don't need to be sitting in shorts in Minnesota in January, but we want to make sure that, that, that comfort is a part of it. I mean, I, I don't think we need to short sell what technology can do, but we just need to do it very intelligently. And then when you start looking at other uh, strategies that are out there, you also look at uh, can food be produced in our region a little bit more effectively? Can we look at annual production in Minnesota? And there's a lot of people that are looking at different greenhouse systems. They're looking at raising fish in these greenhouses and, and treating water, wastewater. So there's a lot of really sophisticated design that can be very um, well thought out and integrated into what we're doing in, in our colder climates, as well as what these warmer climates have access to. So if we can pull it off in Minnesota, it makes it a lot easier and, and attractive to be doing in places like California. Uh, they have some different issues temperature-wise, but uh, you know when, when you're looking at Minnesota, we have potentially, you know, it can get up to 90, 95 degrees in the summer. You can add in some humidity for fun, and then it can drop down to negative 10 and, and further with uh, wind chill. So we have a 100 degree temperature swing. So that's, a, you know, for people that want to be challenged in terms of design, we have some great challenges to work with in <laughs> Minnesota. So, um, and, and everybody thinks about, you know, why, would, why in the world would you live in, in such a cold place on the planet? But uh, a lot of people like what's available here, and they like to go out and play in the snow. So if you're going to live here, we got to make a lifestyle that matches that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we're looking at uh, energy conservation and we're looking at different ways of doing things, you know, it seems to me like the concept of more people working from home, more energy efficient cars, you know, maybe growing our food closer to where we live. So it's really about making those changes. And then as we make those changes, I think there's a ripple effect. For instance, people working more from home, they, they don't need to dress up as much. They do this, they do that. So there's things, they don't drive their car as much. You know, when you're talking about flying, like I, I fly to clients a lot, flying to clients, um, I know exactly how much that costs. I know how much that, that ticket costs. But driving on a daily basis, 
going here, going there, meeting this one, meeting that one. They're, those are almost like unconscious calls. So I think it's really stepping up and figuring out exactly how much money are we really spending in the lifestyle that because we know our money's going, but we don't exactly know where. You know, my energy consumption has dropped dramatically, but I'm very conscious of it. So, you know, ha what are those things that we might not be conscious of? That, you know, what are those things that, that we can make a difference in? you know, just in our daily lives. Well, and I think one of the, uh, the challenges with the way our technology is moving forward, um, and then they're starting to make them smarter boxes, but sometimes like televisions and remotes and those kind of things, uh, toasters, anything that has a clock on it is, is constantly drinking juice from your electricity end of perspective. So a lot of people will have uh, better outlets that, that will switch off you know, you can put an outlet on a timer or you can have a manual switch where you go up and you flip off a, uh, a power strip. So there's lots of really cool power strips that are out there for um, turning things on and off. The challenge is some of the, the devices that are uh, picking up like digital access television require kind of a, con a continued com communication with the system. So when you switch them off, then they flip on and then they, they go into higher energy mode trying to drink all this information back and forth to get caught up. So some mm. appliances, um, it's really difficult to just shut them off and expect them to be able to function when you switch them back on. So I think that's part of the cool thing of with technology shift is they're starting to address some of those issues. But that, that process of having something on and not really intentionally, I mean, it's, it's like it's waiting for the remote control signal, you know, turn me on, turn me on, turn me on, and it's waiting for that remote. Uh, that phantom load of electricity being consumed with this unit just sitting on, those are things that people could do if they can just get adjusted for now, if they have an older set, just hitting a, a power strip, newer uh, technology is adjusting for that issue. So I think you know, the power strip issue alone is a big one. I think another thing that people could easily start to look at, um, and I actually brought some props here if we want to look at them. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, you know, if you look at the light bulb, mm -hmm. um, let me grab these here, sorry. So the standard light bulb, incandescent, great thing from Benjamin Franklin, uh, but the way it works is it heats up this wire inside and then that generates potentially up to 70 to 90 percent heat in the process of creating light. So, you know, technology has shifted. So we've got the, the curly Q, the, the compact fluorescent, and it reduces that electricity consumption pretty significantly. The challenge with these is that uh, if, you're, if they're hanging a lot of the time as the, the fluorescent material is in there, sometimes it shortens the life of the light bulb. So these are a little bit better if they're, they're upright. And uh, some people are really concerned about the mercury, that there's a, a small amount of mercury in these bulbs. So the other option out there is to really just skip those altogether and go for the LED. The LED is a fantastic bulb because you, know, you may be looking at uh, potentially seven watts of, of electricity being used to provide light. The thing you need to pay attention to instead of looking at watts is the lumens. And so you have to do a little bit of homework when you're talking to the people at, at a light store just to understand how bright lumens can be to produce the quality of light you want. So if you're doing task lighting, you may want uh, a different type of lighting than you would in you know, your, your dining area or in a kitchen where you have a lot of activity and you want a lot of bright light. So paying attention to lumens and, and the quality of light that goes on there. But these are, are a fantastic switch. So the higher the lumens, the brighter the light? Is that? Uh, it's, it's, well, there's some of that to it, but there, I mean, there's the quality of the light too. So there's, oh, okay. there's you know, the color, the, the type of light. So there's, yeah, it's better to go to a light store and just flip on a couple and get that feeling yourself rather than trying to just sort of speculate okay. from, from a number. But you know, when you get these, you definitely have to make sure you're realizing that put these in the areas where you have a lot of activity first because these are an expensive bulb. Um, you know, the CFLs, they are $3 and less in terms of cost. These can be, I mean, there, there's some really nice LEDs out there and they can be $20 to $50. So you can get some for 10 and 15 and some for lower, but make sure you're paying attention to the lumens before you buy those bulbs. Okay, but awesome. Changing out light bulbs, these are fantastic. Huge energy savings. And their lifetime is, is significant. Okay. What else do you have to show us? Um, well, one of the projects that we're working on right now in uh, Stanton, we, we excavated the basement, uh, took all the slab out, and then we put in three inches of rigid insulation underneath the slab, re-poured the slab and put in uh, radiant heating in that slab. And then we uh, build out the wall so that if you kind of think about it, um, 
we put in about four, three to four inches of spray foam in the wall in the basement. And so part of that process, we dealt with uh, water that was coming in through the brickwork in the foundation wall. And before we uh, started the work in that box, we actually could see daylight through some of the brickwork. And so uh, we wanted to make sure, because there was a lot of bulk water coming in and filling in that basement, so we put in uh, a control system for that water to move in and behind and down to a drainage system. And then that drains underneath the, uh, the foam. And then that system that's activating the, the drainage tile underneath is also serving as a double function for addressing radon. So we have a passive radon mm -hmm. system to evacuate potential radon out of the box. And then when we spray foamed and put that uh, rigid foam underneath, uh, we created a really, really tight box. So when the boiler is running for the main floor um, radiant floor system, it's actually the boiler itself just running and not sending heat through the tubes right now. It's, it's heating up the basement. So once we get colder temperatures, then we'll turn on that floor system. But right now it's so nice and tight down there. And we doubled the square footage in this, in this house by giving them their basement back. So when we were talking about livable space, mm -hmm. they had storage and stuff in the basement and they had water down there. You know, they could have put a, put a boat down there and had more recreation than they were getting out of the basement at the time. And so, you know, now they've got a recreation space. They've got two bedrooms for their two kids that are, you know, no longer having to share bedrooms. And, and so we've effectively, you know, turned this into a 2,000 square foot space without really having to add on more exterior shape mm -hmm. to the box. So we just made better use of the basement. Wow, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So thank you so much for being here. Well, it's I, definitely a pleasure. I learn so much from you. Every time I talk to you, I learn. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank it was you. great advice. So that's another episode. Was that interesting or what? I, will, I hope everyone takes and uses that information to go and cut their bills and become more energy efficient. I think it was fascinating. Thanks so much. Lori Flecker, Focus Forward. <laughs>